Um, I'm Anne Lounsbury. I'm chair of Department of Russian Slavic Studies at NYU, an affiliate of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia. And the first thing I want to do is thank the Jordan Center, to thank Joshua Tucker, who's the director, and Sasha Spitalnik, who's here with us today, the administrator, because really without the Jordan Center's um, moral, technological, and infrastructural support, we would not be able to do what we're doing. So we're very grateful to the Jordan Center um, for helping 19B uh, run and keep running. Um, and uh, the other thing I want to say about 19B is that for those of you who haven't added your name to the magical Google Doc, which makes you a member of 19B, please do so. I think that Sasha can put the link in the chat once again, in case you haven't seen it. Um, and we welcome everybody's participation and initiatives. Um, I want to quickly announce the next two events in the seminar series. Um, that is on July 29th, same time, we have Colleen Lucy of the University of Arizona, and she's going to speak on Women on the Market, the Dowerless Bride in 19th Century Russia, and her subsidnik will be historian Kent um, Pickering Antonova. Looking forward to that. And then after that, on August 12th, we have a double header or a Buch I guess we have Kat, Kate Bowers, University of British Columbia, and Valeria Sobel from um, University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. And they're going to be talking about new research in the 19th century Russian Gothic. So hope that you'll put those on your calendar. Um, and one final very, very happy announcement before I introduce the, the speaker and the subsidnik is that um, we have just heard from the Jordan Center that they, the center has secured funding for a postdoc for next year. Um, the details are still being worked out, but it's a good postdoc, and it is for next academic year, 2020-2021, which promises to be lean times. The, um, you can look on the website for the details. As I said, they're still being work, worked out, but it's open to many different disciplines. Um, and the application is due August 3rd. So it's coming right up. And um, please, please spread the word. And um, as we get more details, we'll let you know. But we're really, really thrilled that uh, Josh was, was able to, um, to set this up. OK, so I want to introduce our speaker. Before I go to Sasha, who's going to tell us some technical uh, give technical advice. Um, our speaker is Vadim Schneider, whose topic is the mowing scene in Anna Karenina and the poetics of labor at the dawn of Russia's age of capital. It's basically a book talk about, uh, talking about um, the, the, big, the big picture book is called Russia's Capitalist Realism. And um, uh, Vadim Sabsednik is a historian, Yanni Kotsonis, my colleague at NYU, and he's going to be bringing out some of the main themes, and then we'll mostly focus on discussion. Um, okay, thanks very much. Sasha, I'll go to you and you can um, tell us what to do and not to do. Great, thanks, Anne. Uh, sorry, everyone, I'm gonna keep my video off because I'm having some technical connection issues. Um, but just really quickly, um, logistical stuff. So I'm going to mute everybody now. And um, if you could please keep yourselves muted for the duration of the talk, that would be much appreciated. And if you could please also open your chat window and your participants window and update your name to your full name, that would be very helpful. And that's just to facilitate our Q&A, which is going to happen after the lecture. Um, I'm going to partially disable chat for the duration of the lecture portion of today's event. So if you're having any technical difficulties, chat with host will be turned on and you can send me a message. Um, and if necessary, I'll let Vadim or Yanni now, we'll stop the, stop the talk and make sure that everything is solved before we resume. Um, but once we begin the q and I'll enable chat with everyone and you'll be able to submit your questions in the chat and I can read them aloud or you can also send me a message and let me know that you'd like to speak um, and I'll add you to a list and we will call on people in order. Um, and I think that's all that I have. Uh, so Vadim, you can take it away. All right, thank you very much, uh, Sasha. I, I suppose I should at least unmute myself so uh, someone has uh, something to say here. Uh, first of all, I'm 
I should say I'm very, very excited to be here. I don't think I've ever spoken to an audience of over a hundred people before. So this is, this is fun, but also a little bit uh, nerve wracking, I should say. I'll begin by expressing my gratitude to a few people and organizations, because I think that without the 19V initiative and the Jordan Center's support for that initiative, it wouldn't be possible for us to have these sorts of huge international conversations about Russian literature, which I think uh, for me is this, this event and this initiative is really one of the few positives that has emerged out of the uh, bizarre chain of events of the last few months. So I would like to thank the Jordan Center I want to thank Sarah Dickinson for her work in organizing the 19V lecture series and all of her communications to that effect. I certainly want to thank Sasha Spitanik for her technical help uh, during this session and all previous and subsequent sessions of the 19V uh, lecture series. I'd like to thank Anne Lounsbury for her words of introduction and to Yanni Katsunis for agreeing to be my interlocutor, my uh, discussant uh, today, and to all of you in the audience for taking the time to take part and uh, hopefully to uh, gain something from the conversation we're going to have. So thank you all. Uh, the first thing that I will do is I will share a link with everyone. So if you will take a look in your chat window, I'm going to send everyone a link to a Google Doc. Uh, you should have received that right now. And you should be able to open that whether or not you're signed into a Google account and you should see a uh, document. I hasten uh, to, to reassure you that even though it's uh, kind of frighteningly long, we don't have to uh, pay close attention to everything in there. I just wanted to kind of provide you with all of my uh, all of my work so you can check it if you see fit. Uh, you'll find in there uh, a picture of the cover and the table of contents of my forthcoming book about which uh, a little bit uh, in a moment uh, after that the Russian and English translations of several chapters from Anna Karinina and a number of passages from other works of 19th century Russian literature. So that's for you to have if you're interested in following along as I discuss uh, some portions of this text or if you want to look at it afterwards. There's certainly no, no need to read all 20 pages uh, if you're not inclined to do so. All right, so with that I uh, we'll begin. I hope that I'm reasonably audible to everyone. And to begin, I'll just say a few words uh, to introduce a larger project on which this book is based, and then focus more narrowly, more specifically, on the topic of my talk today, which is the mowing scene in uh, Tolstoy's novel Anna Karenina, and what it can tell us about the meaning of different kinds of labor for the realist literary project in the second half of the 19th century. So I should say like the previous event in the series, Alison Lee's wonderful talk of July 1st, mine is also based on a forthcoming book. Uh, the book is called Russia's Capitalist Realism, Tolstoy Dostoevsky and Chekhov, as you can see from the cover image uh, in the Google Doc. And it will, uh, it should, uh, I hope, uh, appear in print on October 15th. So again, as, as you can see uh, in the Google Doc, there's a, there's a table of contents there uh, for the book. The material I will present to you uh, today comes from chapters one and two of the book. It's, it's uh, sort of excerpted from those two chapters. Uh, in chapter one, I discuss the emergence of a set of conventions for the representation of factories in Russian literature in the 19th century. And in chapter two, I examine how Leo Tolstoy's novel uh, deals with Russia's possible economic futures, how it encodes those futures into uh, its narrative. <clears throat> 
Uh, as you can see from the list of chapters, the book covers uh, a range of other topics. It deals with a number of writers. Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, and Chekhov are the major players, but a number of uh, figures from 19th century literature come up. In brief, my goal in the book was to consider how the Russian realist tradition uh, confronted some of the same kinds of issues that we commonly think about when we talk about British, French, or American literature of the 19th century. Uh, issues such as industrialization, the growth of the proletariat and the money economy, the decline of traditional social categories and the ascendancy of new kinds of property owners and business people, and how realist writers sought to give comprehensible form to all of these changes through narrative fiction. It's commonplace to acknowledge that Russia lagged behind these Western countries in its economic development. But as we know, Russian writers and thinkers often look to the West for signs of what possible futures lay ahead for them for, and for Russia. And in this sense, Russia's much talked about backwardness afforded a kind of epistemic advantage for Russian observers over the Western counterparts who had nowhere to look for a sign of things to come because they were at the forefront of wherever it was that history was going. My book deals primarily with the years before Russian Marxism became a serious political force and most of the writers I focus on were not leftists or revolutionaries, but the cascading changes following the emancipation of the Russian serfs that began, certainly didn't end, but began in 1861, was apparent to nearly everyone who was paying attention to Russian society. Indeed, I got the idea for the book when I began to notice how much of the, how much, uh, the classics of 19th century Russian realism had to say about Russian economic life. And as I started to look at lesser read writers in various other kinds of contemporaneous writing, I began to see that distinct, uh, the discussions of the transformative economic changes in the later decades of the 19th century were nearly ubiquitous in uh, Russian uh, culture of the time. I think this isn't particularly surprising. The Russian empire cities were growing, the railway network was expanding, Factories, mills, mines appeared in greater numbers on the outskirts of cities and in various uh, industrial sites around the empire. Discussions of trade, finances, and the development of industry became commonplace in the periodical press, both in specialist publications, but also in those thick journals where articles on state finances or the growth of stock trading appeared side by side with the serialized works of Russian literature that we read, discuss, and teach today. My book examines the Russian realist tradition against this backdrop. I focus on a few particularly charged objects of representation, notably factories, money, and business people. What I'm mostly interested in is how these manifestations of Russia's incipient capitalism became objects of literary representation in the works of a number of writers of that period of the second half of the 19th century. Uh, and especially in the works of Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, and Chekhov. One of the core arguments that I make in the book is that in these years of the Russian Empire's tumultuous transition to capitalism, social problems became issues of literary form. Economic changes posed a number of representational problems for realist literature. Tasked as it was, as it often saw, as, as writers and critics of realism saw themselves as tasked, with the representation of uh, life in its complex contemporaneous development. So for example, some of, these, some of these issues that I think become prominent as problems of literary form, of narrative form for 19th century Russian realism. How do you write about characters whose business success depends on avoiding the kinds of struggles, conflicts, and entanglements that are good at generating plots but are bad for making money? How do you describe sites of industrialized labor when these places defy any comparison to familiar environments? How do you give sensuous form to money, which seems to circulate in the very air, yet usually remains invisible? 
So much of what defined this new era of economic life, so many of these emergent phenomena lay outside the bounds of individual sensory perception. Factories were too loud, commercial networks were too big, financial transactions were too abstract. One of the questions this book asks is how the realist novel adapted to this environment and made it possible to think about capitalism at a time when that concept, the very word capitalism, was only coming into being in the public discourse of various European countries, Russia included. How did Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, and Chekhov, as well as a host of their contemporaries, contribute to our ways of understanding what it means to be part of an economy, to live within a kind of shared economic life? So these are some of the major questions that came up for me as I was working on this book and that I tried to address in the course of writing it. But the book also turned out to be about the limits of realist representation. These phenomena associated with industrial capitalism often turned out to be either too strange or too boring to write about in a comprehensive manner. For example, and I'll say more about this in a moment, it is very hard to find a scene featuring a factory in Russian literature in which, uh, Russian literature of this period, obviously, uh, not later, uh, in which we learn much beyond the fact that the character observing the factory is terrified and overwhelmed by what she or he sees. The sensory overload induced by this new and frightening environment takes over the description. And this remains the case again and again, with a few exceptions, over the course of 40 years of Russian literary representations of factories. Likewise, Russian literature in this period features numerous characters engaged in business. But we tend not to think about them when we think about Russian literature, which is much more famous for characters who are idle, whether that be out of privilege or poverty. In fact, the more successful a character is at making money, the less noteworthy they tend to become, because in effect, running a business successfully in Russian literature means avoiding all of those things that make for interesting reading. When capitalists become protagonists in Russian literature, they are nearly always the second generation, the guilt-ridden and doubtful heirs of ambitious and acquisitive forebears. One consequence of this is that even when capitalism is a very new phenomenon in Russia, it sometimes seems old, even ancient, in its literary representations. At other times, capitalists are successful in business within Russian novels, but this limits the interest that the narrative takes in them. The best example I can think of this, and I discuss this in uh, chapter three of the book, are the two rich capitalists, Totsky and Yipanchin in Dostoevsky's The Idiot, who end up just fine at the end of the novel and keep going with their businesses, accumulating money, uh, while the novel's three primary characters, the ones we remember, of course, Prince Mushkin, Nastasia Filipovna, and Parfyon Rogozhin all end up beyond narratability at the end of the novel by respectively going mad, dying, and being exiled. I think Dostoevsky's works in particular show that money can certainly be exciting, but generally only when it isn't being used to make more money. So there's quite a lot in the book about the problems which Russian literature encounters when it runs into these new sites of labor, new or newly important forms of money, new relationships to space, time, cause and effect that become prominent as factories, railroads, banks, stock exchanges, and business people become important objects of representation. And this brings me to the focus of my talk today, the poetics of labor. And a special focus that uh, will be at the center of my talk uh, over the following minutes is the famous mowing scene in Leo Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. The scene is likely familiar to most of the people in this audience. I'm referring to chapters four and five of part three of the novel, and those are reproduced again, both in English translation and in the Russian original uh, in the handout, and in fact, take up most of that handout. Uh, these are the scenes when the landowning nobleman Konstantin Lovin joins his hired peasant laborers to mow a field on his estate. It's a celebrated scene, frequently discussed in 
critical accounts of this novel. At the same time, it can seem marginal to the main focus of Anna Karenina. After all, Anna, the titular character, has basically nothing to do with Lovin's mowing. And the question sometimes comes up whether in the classroom when we teach this novel or in cinematic adaptations, uh, what meaning could this scene possibly have for a contemporary audience? What connection indeed does it have to the plot uh, of this novel as we tend to remember it? In other words, the scene is at one and the same time uh, a triumph of Tolstoyan descriptive and narrative technique with its vivid attention to the minutiae of embodied experience and also a trace of the novel's distance from most of its readers in the 21st century. And both of these sides of the mowing scene are important for the argument I'm making here. The vividness of the scene, in particular its success in fusing narration and description, is crucial for the ideological work that it accomplishes in the novel. I'll say more about this ideological work in a moment. For now, I want to emphasize first the legibility of labor in this scene. And I speak of that legibility in contrast with other kinds of labor in Russian literature. More about that in a little bit. And second, the capacity of this labor as depicted in this scene to hold together social relations that this novel insists are in the process of dissolving elsewhere in Russia. As far as the scene's remoteness for most readers today, I think this is a clue for us as readers of this novel and of novels generally. Obviously, Russia was an overwhelmingly agrarian society in the 1870s. The majority of its population were peasants who worked the land and agricultural labor was thus a matter of everyday life for most subjects of the Russian Empire. It was crucial for landowning nobles as the major source of their wealth, but the majority of 19th century Russian novels that we continue to read, discuss, and teach have very little to say about the specifics of agricultural labor. I can even go farther and say that these novels generally have little to say about working in general. This isn't very surprising, I think, since major characters need free time to live out their novelistic lives. But there is also a great deal that novels don't discuss in detail because it is assumed by writers that this material presents no particular interest to the reader. This is the case in Anna Karenina when it comes to plenty of subjects, but to, to remain uh, focused on what I'm talking about now, for example, we learn pretty much nothing about Steve Oblonsky's various office jobs, even though both the fact of his having to work is important because it illustrates the decline of the Russian aristocracy, and so is how he works. That is to say, how he uh, tends not to exert himself in his various jobs. But with that in mind, it is remarkable that the mowing scene is the most famous scene of Russian, uh, of people laboring in 19th century Russian literature, and perhaps in 19th century literature in general. Tolstoy clearly regarded the description of what it is like to mow a field as worthy of many passages in his novel, of many pages, I should say, in his novel. Again, the majority of Russia's population in the 1870s lived lives that were shaped by agricultural labor. But the mowing scene in Anna Karenina is redolent with nostalgia for something that is vanishing and needs to be preserved in art. Its importance, that is, of the scene uh, extends far beyond Leuven's individual story, although it is, of course, a crucial moment of healing for him after Kitty Sherbatsky refuses his marriage proposal. But beyond Leuven's individual experience in the novel, the mowing scene becomes a kind of social allegory, and in that regard is closely related to Leuven's own reflections on Russia's developmental path in his book on the theory and practice of Russian agriculture. In this regard, the mowing scene represents a kind of rearguard action against economic and social forces that threaten to destabilize or destroy the world that Leuven as a proud member of the landed aristocracy is eager to defend. The scene's vividness also reminds us that forms of activity particularly associated with coming economic changes, such as factory labor and capital accumulation, remained obscure and difficult to represent in numerous works of Russian literature from this period. <clears throat> 
the mowing scene, on the contrary, is exceedingly representable. Hence, its elaborate uh, description of the course of two chapters. One of the most remarkable features of Leuven's experience do during the mowing is that he stops feeling the passage of time. This is one of those features of the mowing scene that's frequently discussed. But before that happens, before Leuven uh, loses track of time as he's absorbed by the uh, uh, rhythm of the mowing, he's very anxious not to fall behind the peasant mowers who are more efficient and less likely to get tired. As a result of Leuven's worries, the pages describing the mowing are punctuated by references to time. Early on, a mower warns him not to lag behind. The Russian word is atstavat. And as he begins to work, uh, this concern recurs insistently. Tolstoy's characteristic repetitions here achieve a formal modeling of Leuven's thought process as forms of the verb atstavat occur six times over the following three pages usually in terms of the danger of Leuven lagging behind the peasants. But as he gets uh, swept up in the rhythm of the work, it turns out that Leuven does not lag behind the others. And so he gives himself over to this rhythm and begins to experience those moments in which he does not notice time. Over the pages that follow, you read an exquisitely detailed description of the bodily sensory experience of the mowing, the exhaustion of muscles, the feeling of sweat and heat uh, from the sun on one's back. Leuven ceases to sense time, but the narration lingers on this scene. Supplementing the rhythm of the mowing itself is the pattern of intervals between the mowing of individual paths. As Leuven contemplates one path, he and the reader are afforded a view of the surrounding landscape and a respite from the work. The mowing provides the narrator opportunity for the detailed enumeration of the natural objects that the mowers encounter, including branches, quail nests, animals in the grass. Uh, this labor requiring the full effort of both body and mind generates vast quantities of sensory data for the novel to record and process. Yet the work is also calm enough to allow Leuven to pause and look around as he rests. In a word, mowing supports both narration and description, which are held together in careful balance in these pages. There are qualities peculiar to this kind of labor, I mean agricultural labor, that allows both the human being and literary representation to flourish. That at least is what this scene seems to suggest. And this is in contrast to other kinds of labor and especially industrialized labor in factories and mills. It was held by many social critics, theorists, and writers, including Tolstoy himself, to be profoundly harmful both to workers and in a broader sense, as, as I will argue towards the end of this talk, to literary representation itself. At the same time, as I will discuss in the following part of this talk, the representation of the factory in realist literature uh, serves as a case study in the problems of incorporating the emergence of capitalism into the realist literary tradition. The language with which the narrator describes Leuven's integration into the work of mowing parallels Leuven's own theory of how the Russian economy ought to develop. And this is where the mowing scene makes contact with those broader social issues uh, that are discussed in Anna Karenina. As Leuven thinks about his book on agriculture, he argues that the Russian economy should develop in such a way that, quote, the other branches of wealth do not outrun, uh, the, uh, the Russian word here is aperijat, uh, agriculture, that in conformity with a given state of agriculture, there should exist corresponding means of communication, end of quote. And that the railroads, rather than helping agriculture, so Leuven argues, Quote, had outrun agriculture and halted it, causing the development of industry and credit, and therefore just as the one-sided and premature development of one organ in an animal would hinder its general development, so credit, the means of communication, the increase of factory industry, though undoubtedly necessary in Europe where their time had come, here in Russia only harm the general development of wealth by setting aside the main immediate question 
of the organization of agriculture, end of quote. These are all Leuven's reflections as he uh, plans his book on agriculture in Russia. So just as it is essential for all the mowers to work in synchronized rhythm in the field, Leuven argues that the entire economy of Russia must develop as an organic whole, its various interrelated components moving at the correct pace. Otherwise, industry, credit, and other branches of Western-style modernization threaten to cripple agriculture and encourage the formation of a dangerously lopsided civilization. Elsewhere in the novel, Leuven is already struggling with the consequences of a rapidly changing society. Many of his difficulties stem from the fact that the peasants themselves are stuck between two times. On the one hand, they exhibit the traditional distrust of the serf for the master. When Leuven tries to negotiate mutually beneficial payment schemes or technological upgrades, the peasants refuse to change their ways. On the other hand, all these people live in a post-emancipation society in which the landowner cannot compel people to work for him. Instead, Leuven constantly struggles with the peasant workers, who are frequently referred to as robochia, uh, whom he needs to do the work on his lands. In the mowing scene, on the other hand, the narrator refers to the peasants exclusively as peasants, mujiki, rather than workers, robochia. Earlier in the novel, Leuven despairs at the incompatible motivations guiding him, the employer, and the workers whom he has to pay. But in the mowing scene, these incompatibilities seem to fade. A much older, more stable form of social relations seems to emerge, in which the painful adjustment to a new system of free labor, the much discussed question of volna naomni uh, trut, uh, and relations mediated by contracts and payment is temporarily suspended. Outside of Leuven's estate, much larger problems loom. Other, less devoted landlords are forced to sell off their lands, like Steve Oblonsky. Even more significantly, Anna herself becomes ensnared in that dangerously accelerating urban industrial civilization with its trains and consumer goods. Her role in all of this is, of course, much greater than a few sentences can accommodate, and I discuss her place in all of this much more extensively in the relevant chapter of the book. But we also see, we also know that Leuven has traveled to Europe where he has visited not the capitals, but the industrial cities. When he runs into Shcherbatsky, Kitty's cousin, the letter mockingly invites Leuven to see the other Europe, to join him in Paris rather than in the industrial city of Mulhouse. Uh, we never read anything about what Leuven encounters on his travels, but it is clear that he didn't like what he saw there. He boldly declares to Steva at one point that, quote, there can be no workers question in Russia, end of quote. His tours of industrial Europe have, have reinforced his idea that Russia will take its own path. The novel contains dark intimations of the alternative possibility that Russia is already undergoing that dangerous industrialization. These are associated with the train, with Anna, and with the terrifying nightmares in which she sees a dirty and disheveled peasant laborer who mutters strange words in French about working iron. These glimpses of an industrial nightmare are suggestive, but we have to look elsewhere in the Russian realist tradition to see actual factories and industrial sites in operation. And if we do so, we find much more than a confirmation of the commonplace view among a wide range of opinionated Russians of the time that factories were bad. We also find that despite the overwhelming physical presence of the factories, these sites in Russian literature turn out to be remarkably difficult to describe. We don't often think of Russian literature before the October Revolution as a tradition rich in scenes of industrial labor. One reason for that probably has to do with the kinds of 19th century Russian literature that we habitually read and discuss. But if we expand the list of 19th century Russian works a little bit, we begin to see that factory scenes become more common from the early 1850s onward. In fact, there are enough of these scenes that the, their conventionality starts to become apparent. And I've provided you with several examples of this towards the end of the Google Doc. These are, uh, I believe, items three through six. 
Factory scenes tend to be isolated from the larger narratives in which they are set and typically feature a newcomer to the factory. This person often gazes through a window or takes a tour of the facilities led by a more experienced guide. Whatever the narrator of these works was focused on before the scene began, when the character observes the factory, the narrative zooms in on his or her subjective experience and stays there as long as the factory is in focus. We read what the visitor of the factory experiences and usually almost nothing else. And what the visitor experiences is invariably a kind of sensory disintegration in which little meaning can be extracted from an overwhelming sense, an overwhelming mass rather, of sensory data. The visitor in these scenes can be a peasant who has never set eyes on a factory before, or it can be the factory's owner. Little seems to change. Regardless, the description that ensues is largely the same. And for the sake of a couple of examples, I'll uh, ask you to take a look at two of these, one from the beginning of the tradition and one from the end, so we get a sense of the kind of commonalities that I'm talking about here. So first I'll ask you to take a look at item two on pages 19 and 20 of the Google Doc handout. Uh, this is a scene from Dmitry Grigorovich's The Fisherman, Rybaki, from 1854, a novel about peasant life. And here a peasant named Grishka looks through the window of a mill and is stunned by what he sees. And I'll just read the uh, English translation. Gradually, there opened up before him an endless view of joists, beams, pillars, and poles crossing each other in every possible manner, a, ver a veritable wooden spider web. Through all the gaps in this wooden spider web could be glimpsed rapidly spinning wheels, which were operated by boys and girls covered in streams of sweat. They must have been suffocated, suffocating. There was nothing remarkable in that. Even the strongest worker, after spending a year in the stifling air, began to weaken and dry up. The wood was drying and cracking. The ceiling and walls were glossy with condensation like in a banya. The still flames of tallow candles were suspended by gloomy yellow circles, sorry, were surrounded by gloomy yellow circles. The light had a hard time penetrating this dense atmosphere. People were crowded like pickles in a barrel. It was impossible to point a finger without running into a joist, a stretched out warp, or the back of someone's head. The heads of women, girls, and weavers of all ages would pop out everywhere, red and blue headscarves, black and red hair and beards, pale faces, pink and white shirts, dazzled one's eyes like the glass of a kaleidoscope aimed at a candle. All of this moved in the light of a few dozen tallow candle ends in tin holders. The deafening clatter of shutters, the pounding of battens, the hiss of wheels, voices, laughter, and songs filled the whole building. That's the end of the quotation. And for a comparison, please take a look at item six, which is from a much better known work, a story by Anton Chekhov called A Woman's Kingdom, Babia Tsarstva from 1895 in which a rich industrialist visits her steel mill, which she has inherited from her father. Here we read, high ceilings with iron beams, a multitude of enormous rapidly turning wheels, belts and levers, the piercing hiss, the screeching of steel, the clatter of carts, the harsh puffing of steam, the faces pale or red or blackened from coal dust, the shirt soaked with sweat, the glint of steel, copper and fire, the smell of oil and coal, and the wind, now very hot, now cold, produced on her an impression of hell." End of quote. To be sure, there are important differences between these scenes, and I discuss them in the book, but they also display a remarkable degree of consistency, both in their focus on the perceptions of a naive observer and on their suggestion, or indeed at times explicit insistence that there just isn't much to say about factories beyond this kind of paragraph. In a small number of scenes, such as in Ivan Turgenev's Virgin Soil, Nov from 1876, an experienced specialist goes inside the factory. In these scenes, we again see what the visitor sees, but this time it is a habituated gaze, one from which the details of the factory are automatized, no longer worth paying close attention to unless something is going wrong. 
As a result, the factory descriptions vary between two extremes. Either they are too terrifying and overwhelming to comprehend, or they are utterly predictable in their repetitiveness and thus too boring to take much notice of. And again, this tendency, uh, these two extremes, persist in the representation of Russian factories over the course of about 40 years until the second half of the 1890s, in literature at least. We can look to Tolstoy himself for one explanation of what is going on in these strange scenes. And it is with this Tolstoyan explanation that I will conclude. Years after writing Anna Karenina, Tolstoy wrote an essay called The Slavery of Our Time in 1900, uh, in which he took issue with the idea that factories and industry were necessary at all. Instead of discussing ways of ameliorating working conditions in factories, Tolstoy insists that industrial labor is fundamentally incompatible with human well-being. The chief problem with industrial labor appears to be its monotony, однообразность, and this is a physical, moral, and aesthetic problem. Monotony appears to be the key feature distinguishing healthy, meaningful work, such as pre-industrial agriculture, from work that has no meaning to the person performing it. Tolstoy repeatedly contrasts the effects of free, healthy, varied, and meaningful, this is his uh, quotation, uh, agricultural work, with the unhealthy, repetitive, and stupefying conditions of industrial labor. He writes, quote, all the sages and poets of the world always saw the realization of the ideal of human happiness only under the conditions of agricultural labor, end of quote. And then again, uh, working people whose habits have not been perverted prefer and have always preferred agricultural labor over all other kinds, end of quote. Furthermore, he writes, quote, factory labor is always unhealthy, monotonous, whereas agricultural labor is the healthiest and most varied. Agricultural labor is always free, that is, svobodny. Uh, in other words, the worker alternates labor with rest according to his will, whereas labor at the factory, even if it belonged to the workers themselves, is always unfree, dependent on the machine, end of quote. Tolstoy insists that the temporality of industrial labor, governed by machines rather than the rhythms of the human body, makes it fundamentally incompatible with human flourishing. Not only are the intervals of agricultural labor better synchronized with the natural rhythms of the human body and therefore able to accommodate periods of labor and rest, but the synchronization also corresponds to the appropriateness of that kind of work to the demands of human freedom. What is more, Tolstoy explicitly emphasizes the aesthetic qualities of agricultural labor when he insists that all the sages and poets of the world had incorporated praise of agricultural labor into their works. Agricultural labor allows for the full development of human capabilities, whereas industrial labor mutilates them. The more that regimes of industrial labor depart from natural ways of human, uh, for humans to be in the world, the more difficult it becomes to integrate them into a literary form founded on the representation of human sensory experience. The mowing scene in Anna Karenina offers a striking contrast, a form to, to that industrial labor, a form of labor that is perfectly suited to the human sensorium. Unlike the industrial development that threatens to tear Russia apart, the mowing protects human community. With this in mind, the mowing scene isn't just remarkable as a scene of labor in a realist novel, where scenes of this sort are generally rare. It is especially remarkable that this agricultural labor is performed under remarkably archaic conditions in a kind of time warp amidst uh, Russia's, Russian literature's factory scenes. It becomes, in effect, an extraordinary act of aesthetic recuperation, a transfiguration of exhausting toil into beautiful art. It is also a powerful suggestion, one of several in this novel, that some of the features we most closely associate with Tolstoyan storytelling technique, with its vivid sensory detail and stunning insight into corporeal experience, is linked to, indeed, is dependent on a certain relationship between landowner, land, and peasants. Dostoevsky famously labeled the works of Tolstoy and Turgenev as landowner's literature, contrasting this tradition with his own novels, fracturing social bonds and values in crisis. 
what I've been discussing here is one sense in which Tolstoy's literature is indeed landowner's literature. But this isn't a matter of Dostoevsky superseding Tolstoy to inaugurate a new literary era. Dostoevsky faced comparable problems, although his focus was more on the poetics of money than labor. But in the work of both of these writers, as well as many others of the time, we witness realism straining against its limits, limits that become especially apparent when literature sets itself the task of giving form to capitalism. But I don't think that this is only a story of failure. We still rely at times on physically perceptible stand-ins for abstract or invisible uh, economic phenomena. To take an example that always amuses me, uh, when the evening news shows stock traders yelling on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, it's a way of representing the turbulence of the stock market. This, this strikes me as a comparable kind of uh, uh, visualization. I think that these uh, that those conventionalized factory scenes in Russian literature did something comparable. The mowing scene in Anna Karenina seems to suggest that this triumph of Russian realism required a pre-industrial civilization with its organic social forms and its steady rhythms of agricultural labor. But as I've tried to show in this discussion, it was precisely the pressure of this history with the capital H, these incipient economic transformations that made the scene possible. And that in a bigger sense, uh, it is this history, it is this historical pressure that gives Russian realism of this period its extraordinary power. Thank you. Vadim, thank you so much. I think we'll go to Yanni Kotsonis now. Can anyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah, good. Yes. Uh, Vadim, thank you. Thank you, Vadim. Um, uh, it was a wonderful text to read and it's beautifully written. Uh, it's, it's a language that even I can understand. And it's um, and, and and the way you speak as well, you know, sort of it's uh, it's straightforward. It's a uh, subject verb object, and it makes points. And uh, what I like particularly is uh, basically what you've done is you've you've done the work of a capitalist. You've reached into a, a context, ripped out something and abstracted it, and created something new. I mean, that's what capitalism does. So there's this dual swing in your work in which you're describing something which is precisely. Um, how it is that um, uh, you know relations and uh, persons uh, are, are reduced to money or, or not reduced to but expressed as money uh, the discomfort and the anxiety about how human beings can be expressed in, in rubles um, or even more abstractly as you know pieces of paper that represent something and seem to be something of value but it's not clear why and um, uh, that's what capitalism does and that's what you do as well which makes perfect sense you know and, and I think a good Marxist should be doing that, you know, understanding um, what can be seen if we look at it in the right way, if you're following me, buddy. Um, uh, uh, so, so it's a wonderful text. And, I've, uh, you know, all I can do is extend the, uh, extend the, the conversation in different ways. Um, uh, uh, you know, it seems to me that when we're talking about capitalism, we use it as a, as a catch-all and it's right and it is transformative. I'm haunted by the idea that, um, you know, you can see capitalism. There's no doubt in my mind that this is what we're dealing with, particularly by the late 19th century. At the same time, I'm haunted by the idea that they themselves don't know it. Um, and so they're, they're finding other ways to try to explain what it is that makes them anxious. Uh, they focus on certain things. And I think if I, if I understand correctly, what it really comes down to is a money economy and the monetization of people and relations. Um, now, now here's where I wonder, and you know, this, there's something, you know, capitalism is introduced in different places in different ways, and um, there's no one way to be a capitalist. And, uh, and I'm wondering if we're talking about narrating a, uh, the particular way in which Russia entered capitalism and, 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 and became capitalist in certain ways. And, um, uh, uh, and also something which is not necessarily that new and they themselves didn't see it as necessarily new. So there's something liminal and something intermediate here um, that's going on. You know, it's capitalism, but they don't see it themselves, right? It's money relations, but they don't see that as part of capitalism necessarily. Um, and as I said, this is, don't take this as a criticism. It's not. It's, uh, I'm, I'm trying to extend the, the conversation and, and take it into a different way, particularly with that general framework. Um, and the reason why I think it matters that it's money is precisely because uh, that it's a money economy that we're talking about is because they themselves um, um, uh, see it as a money economy. Now, if this is true, 
what do we do with Gogol? Um, uh, what do we do with the Volga boatmen? I mean, these, are these part of capitalism as well? I mean, the Volga boatmen are something approaching slavery, right? Or, or is this capitalist labor, right? Um, uh, what do you do with Gogol? So Gogol does something interesting. So he's horrified and amused and satirical about the emergence of at least the infrastructure of capitalism. Um, he grew up around the time of the introduction of the joint stock company, meaning a corporation, um, where Russians couldn't believe that, you know, because you say that a person exists on paper, that this is a juridical person. You know, it's just going to be true. Um, um, uh, they're saying, you know, they, and of course, this is part of the satire. And the same thing, when you take dead souls, you put them on paper and you make a lot of money off of people who don't exist, and yet you're calling them people. Um, and here, I wouldn't go as far as to say this is a sign of backwardness. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say it's archaic. Um, it's of that time and place. You know, it's Russia at that particular time. Um, uh, and so then we move into the later period, and it's true that objectively, objectively, you can set up the context. You can say, well, look, there's been emancipation, there's been um, uh, industrialization, there is a working class for sure, um, uh, but they themselves again don't see it. Right? They, they see it as something very specific and very peculiar. Um, and now, in terms of capitalists, you know, the, who might be the capitalists? In other words, so all of us are capitalists in a certain way because we begin to embrace the money economy and we sh we fetishize money. Um, but in terms of the capitalists, they're few and far between. Um, uh, we're talking, you know, if you're to talk about the real bourgeois, you know, if there is such a thing even in Russia, but the real bourgeois, you know, self-confident, assertive, seizing the future and guiding the country to it, it would be, uh, you know, a few industrialists in Moscow, you know, the Davushinsky circle, Kiritiakov, Kanovalov, you know, that kind of crowd who cater to a domestic market. And for them, it really is, you know, accumulating capital, catering to this domestic market and creating some sort of nation, you know, the Russian people. But they're the only ones. Um, and, uh, and what I find interesting about this period is that the, um, you know, so, so you made a distinction and you said, well, in Gogol, they're just talking about quick profit. Whereas in a later period, they have this longer view uh, that they're here to stay and they look at the long term. And I think that's true of some of them. But the big criticism of the capitalists in Russia at the time was, the, um, uh, was that they don't have the longer view, except for a few. Uh, they too were involved in speculative operations, building a railway and making tons of money. And the big shock was, you know, how is it that you who work um, less than most people, particularly when it comes to using your hands, how is it that you can walk away with 500,000 rubles, a million rubles, meaning it's shocking. Um, and they can't believe that this is really is value. Uh, they can't understand, you know, wh where are you getting this capital and how are you making this profit? Um, uh, uh, and there's, a, so there's a certain way, I think, in which capitalism, I mean, others have made this argument as well, um, and what's interesting about the writers you're looking at and the way that they look at what you call capitalism and what I agree we can call capitalism um, is that it never really takes, uh, it never really takes hold, right? Um, I mean, there's a state-centered capitalism and that, that takes hold and then continues into the 1920s, if you buy that argument, I do, um, you know, accumulation but state run, uh, but a capitalist class, you know, and a bourgeois class and all of these things, I mean, it's not, it's, there's nothing wrong that they're missing, but, but it's not a profound aspect of, of Russian society in the late 19th century. Um, uh, and, and this is what I, what, I, what I take away from what you're writing about, um, uh, which is that you know, it is, right, but it doesn't have to be. Here, there are other possibilities. That beaten path that others have followed, we don't have to follow. Um, and it, may, it opens up other possibilities, you know, sort of a, a, a moral objection, you know, with Gogol, uh, fascination for everybody else, um, uh, but it doesn't have to be our future as well. And that's it. And is that is that good? Is that is that enough? Okay. All right. And now I'll mute. Sorry, I should unmute myself to say thank you very much. Interesting questions, Vadim. We go to you. Thanks, Anne, and thank you very much, Yanni, for uh, your comments, for your engagement with my work. Uh, you raise a great many uh, very interesting questions and uh, I could go in a number of different directions in my response. Uh, I, think, I think I will emphasize a couple of different, uh, a, a couple of primary points. Uh, one of which is that uh, I, I agree that one, one of the central uh, issues that I found myself dealing with in the book uh, is precisely the sense that these writers 
uh, in the later 19th century, we're dealing with uh, what is apparent to us as capitalism, but they didn't know it. Uh, I, I talk a little bit about uh, the kind of uh, gradual uh, dispersal of an, an elaboration of the concept of capitalism in late 19th century uh, public discourse in various uh, European languages. But uh, the way that we think about our common economic life, the way that we make sense of the world we live in with terms like the economy of with capitalism, we're not available, uh, certainly not in the same way to uh, 19th century Russian writers. And so the way in which these things uh, take shape, particularly as they are transformed into uh, the material of, of literary representation, takes uh, quite interesting uh, forms, forms that are surely different from anything that uh, a contemporary uh, writer trying to make sense of contemporary life would uh, probably choose. But one of the central uh, aspects for 19th century Russian writers, I think, is money, monetization, the, uh, the way in which the increasing uh, sense of the prevalence of money uh, imposes a new, a new thinking about the comparability, the convertibility between things uh, that makes it somehow more prominent in Russian discourse. Uh, in the realist period, but here, here I, I kind of feel the need to go into different directions because Gogol is certainly an extremely uh, important uh, figure that stands uh, at the very early stages of what I'm talking about. And with him, of course, the legacy of serfdom, uh, its persistent significance for the way that Russians think about uh, the convertibility of, say, individuals or the calculability of values. So the other thing that uh, I want to emphasize Sorry, I'm just kind of trying to trying to think of all of the different directions in which this could go. Meanwhile, there is uh, a lot of noise outside my window that I hope that uh, is not distracting people uh, as much as it is uh, distracting me. Uh, but the the other thing that I want to emphasize and uh, which I tried to hold in view throughout this project, and this is one of the reasons why I think it is particularly interesting to have a conversation about this work with a historian is that I had to find the various ways in which 19th century Russian writers made sense of these, uh, of their own understanding filtered through contemporary public discourse of these historical uh, changes uh, within literary forms, how they took elements of public discourse about the uh, say development of these phenomena that we understand as capitalism and turn them into narratives, turn them into scenes uh, based on uh, the description and the narration of certain uh, phenomena conditioned by literary conventions, by established ways of doing things uh, in novels and in other literary forms. And so one of the questions that you ask Yanni, and I think it's a, it's a significant question about whether uh, what we see in Russian literature is uh, kind of working through the peculiarities of Russian capitalism versus other kinds of capitalism. One of the things that struck me as I was doing research for this book is the extent to which uh, the relatively small scale uh, incipient phenomena uh, taking place in Russia were often seen by contemporaries 
uh, in terms of the kind of uh, their, their anticipatory significance, uh, the way that they point to processes much farther advanced in Western countries. Uh, comparing 19th century discourse on these things to, uh, to the way that scholars discuss them now, sometimes, uh, sometimes it strikes me how much uh, 19th century Russian commentators, not always, but in, in certain cases were inclined to see their situation as more comparable to the Western uh, countries than perhaps we are today. And so in many cases, uh, it does strike me that in works of literature, things that uh, are harder to find in actual uh, documented Russian historical experience, such as this kind of far-seeing rational capitalist accumulation becomes more significant as, a, as, a, as an element of literary narrative than uh, it was in, uh, say, contemporary discussions of what capitalists were actually doing. And so, I would say that on the whole, one of the things that uh, confronted me throughout this project was thinking about the ways that the Russian realist literary tradition makes use of uh, its representational resources, but also confronts its own uh, limits in turning these matters of public discourse, matters of public awareness into uh, elements of plot, into elements of literary form. So I, I could go into uh, more detail, say, with uh, some of the other writers I discussed, the way that they deal with uh, some of these phenomena. But I'm wondering if perhaps we ought to introduce a few more questions into the discussion, and then I can return to some of the themes that Yanni has brought up. Sure, I can go ahead and start um, reading people's questions and calling on people. Um, we had a question from Jennifer Flaherty. Jennifer, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, sure. Uh, thank you, Vadim, for a really interesting talk. Um, so I had two questions and then a comment that will hopefully sort of expand the first question. So my first question is, um, you, you seem to be arguing, or you, you are arguing, I'll correct me if I'm wrong, um, that the labor of mowing is representable, and then contrast that with the labor, factory labor. And I was actually thinking, I'm, I'm wondering what you do with the fact that, you know, as, as Jovan is, is mowing, he kind of lo loses consciousness and the scene ends. So there's an element of the unrepresentable there. And as I was thinking about that, um, you know, when we turn to the Grigorovich scene, it begins in a way that, you know, there's a phrase there. It was like, what is it? Malapamalamu peridnim atkrilas. And that exact kind of phrasing is everywhere in, in at the sort of beginnings of the mowing scene. And then when they take a break and then they go back to it, right? It's this kind of passed peridnim atkrilas. And that passivity that kind of continues into, uh, you know, what's so important about the scene. And I, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, is there not, you know, you talk about it as being highly representable, but especially in this linkage to the factory scene, is there not something of the unrepresentable there. And if it's sort of positively charged, then how do you make sense of the fact that, you know, in this other context, we want to label it as negatively charged. Um, so my second question is, is, is somewhat related, and it's about time and labor. So, so it's just re really interesting to me, and, and I wonder if you talk about this, and, and, and you know, I, I'd love to hear what you think about it, that if agricultural labor for Tolstoy is timeless, 
I mean, one way of thinking about capitalist labor is it's entirely dependent, at least on a kind of mechanistic time, right? Um, so for anybody who's had an office job, you know that like you're just sort of battling the clock or a factory job for that matter, right? Like there is absolutely no forgetting of time because the time is, is, is your lack of freedom, right? You have to be in that chair or in that field or doing whatever it is that you're doing until, um, until quitting time. Um, and of course, time, time, time is money there as well. So, so I'm just, I'm just curious about, you know, if, if you, if you deal with that or what you think about it. And then uh, the third, um, sorry, I don't want to take up too, too much time, but just really quickly, um, I just wanted to, 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 to share something, and then this will hopefully lead back to the first question. So I'm, um, I'm doing some work for a farming community in, in Zambia, and I interviewed somebody just yesterday, so it's on my mind. And this person is what's called an extension officer, and what that means is it's people who know a whole lot about agricultural practices, and they go into farming communities and teach the farmers, hey, look, you should be really, use, really be using this technology or this mindset. And I came to this interview with questions that I realize are now very Tolstoyan. Um, so, so questions like, well, how do you know what, what determines their mindset? And what about their own traditions? And, and that kind of thing, you know? And I guess what was so sort of sobering and, and humbling to me about, about the interview um, was, you know, his responses were like, look, yeah, I mean, farmers are skeptical of new technologies only if they don't see them work. But as soon as you sort of demonstrate to them that like, hey, this works and it could make your life easier, or save you that time, that kind of thing, um, you know, there, there is no kind of resistance on, on, on behalf of some kind of like traditional, like get out of our community kind, kind of a mindset. And so the, the reason that I like wanted to share this and, and think that it might link back up to my first question is that, you know, in, in fact, like, there are this sort of distinction between factory labor and agricultural labor between new technologies and and even some sort of factory based technologies and agricultural work it, you know is is not it's just really not what it what it feels like to to to, to be working in that kind of way um for, for the farmers and and i wonder if what holds now also holds then and that by distinguishing as you do the sort of okay agricultural labor looks like this and factory labor looks like this. What if in fact, I mean that, and again, this goes back to sort of my first point that, you know, at Kirillus Humu, there's some similarities. What if in fact, there's a way of looking at them as kind of interrelated. And even if Tolstoy and his didactic materials didn't want to say that they're related because, you know, he has so much ideologically invested in keeping them separate. What if there is something about literature actually that sort of has that indirect Oh no, actually, you know what? Maybe if this distinction that you know we're so invested in is a false one. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, thank you again. Thank you. Uh, just just uh, ask, ask uh, an organizational question. Should I, should I respond to questions individually or should we uh, collect several questions. I think for now you can respond individually. Sasha, does that sound reasonable? And then if we start to run out of time, Sasha can collect questions. Yeah, that sounds fine to me, whatever you prefer. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for, for those questions and comments. Uh, I think, first of all, to kind of begin, begin with one of the last things you said, I think that absolutely there, there are important ways in which agricultural and industrial labor are interrelated. And the sharp distinction that I make for the purposes of argument, of course, uh, has the effect of uh, concealing, but also maybe uh, uh, encouraging us to think about the ways in which uh, both of these are indeed comparable. And one of, one of the points I, I was trying to make in the talk that maybe didn't come out quite uh, clearly enough is that the way in which uh, agricultural labor is uh, represented in Anna Karenina uh, contrasted as 
uh, it seems to be for polemical purposes with other kinds of labor. Uh, that particular way of approaching agricultural labor is, of course, uh, deeply conditioned by uh, the, the sense that Leuven himself uh, seems to feel that uh, the conditions of possibility of, of this kind of labor are threatened by uh, changes taking place. There are absolutely important uh, dimensions of the mowing that are not readily representable. There are things that Leuven himself, to the extent that our awareness of the scene is conditioned by his consciousness, uh, there are things that he cannot uh, register or cannot process. One, one of these uh, certainly is this relationship to time, but there is a great deal that seems to happen automatically. He uh, becomes integrated into this work process. And uh, the more he is integrated into the work process, the less uh, we can read about the work. So this, this is absolutely uh, an important point to keep in mind. Uh, to my mind, one of the crucial differences between uh, the mowing scene and these scenes of industrial labor is that in none of them is a person participating in the industrial labor. Uh, they are always observers. They are always observers uh, passing through or looking at scenes of industrial labor. Uh, in most of those, indeed, uh, the work is the least visible thing. Uh, what is discernible is the fragmentary machinery, the sounds and uh, the various kinds of sensory impressions that it makes. And these certainly uh, produce a great deal of sensory data for uh, the work of literature to record. But what remains from that experience is the sense of chaos. There is no sense in which the observer uh, understands what is taking place. And this strikes me in particular when we contrast the ways that factory scenes work in Russian literature to the way that factories work in contemporaneous Russian writing. Beginning at least with the early 1870s, there's an increasing amount of sort of investigative journalism where people go into factories and they describe the working conditions, they write about the workers and about the kinds of things they do. And the way that these scenes are uh, written in Russian literature for decades after this remains quite different from the way that they are written about in these other genres of writing. They also find that this highly conventionalized representation in which, uh, again, what becomes primary to my mind uh, is this inability of the individual parts to cohere into some kind of comprehensive impression. Uh, and again, what strikes me uh, in the contrasting example of the mowing scene is the sense that despite these crucial gaps in uh, Leuven's own consciousness, these things that he does not notice, there is a sense in which uh, the mowing becomes a process, not, not so much, uh, well, what, what, what I mean by that is that it becomes a process in which, uh, despite Leuven himself losing his track of time, uh, one row is mowed, then there is an interval of rest, then another mow, uh, then another row is mowed, and eventually the work is completed. There, there is this kind of narrative process to it. Eventually the, the uh, meadow gets mowed. Uh, in the factory scenes, there is never this kind of process. There is a kind of perpetual motion that leads to nothing, that the observer can only enter, look at for a little bit, and depart. Uh, once the observer is gone, presumably the same thing continues. And this is one sense in which time operates very differently uh, in the factory scenes uh, and in the mowing scenes. And I think one of the reasons that the factory scenes 
resist integration into some kind of narrative process. The mowing scene is part of Leuven's experience, it's part of his life in a way that these visitors to the factory, they see the factory, they leave it behind, and even when their livelihood is intimately related to it, somehow the factory itself remains stubbornly uh, outside of the major events of their, uh, their uh, narratives. Great. Uh, we have a question from Eric Naiman. Eric, if you uh, you can raise, if you want to unmute yourself, you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, um, Adim. I thought your talk was extremely interesting, particularly this notion of realism straining against its limits and the difficulty of giving form to to capitalism, and it it raised a kind of couple of I don't know questions or or dichotomies that I wonder. Um, uh, how you would reflect on um, one is is the notion of um, you know whether there can be what a capitalist novel would be or are we really talking about anti capitalist novels um, does the capitalist novel produce a novel that is paradoxically resistant to capitalism and of course it's paradoxical because in a way um, these novels as you so, as you showed kind of um, either default to um, uh, a kind of uh, demonism and spiritualism because capital and, and, and kind of spectral because capitalism is so difficult to represent or it becomes boring and then people won't buy it and the market is, is important to the success of the, uh, of the novel. And a kind of paradox here is this, this sort of mala pa mala is, is that, um, you know, the difference between speculation and investment in terms of the writing and consumption of a novel and in terms of what the novel depicts. And of course, in a way, you know, um, capitalism is everywhere present and nowhere visible, um, like the kind of masterful novel, realistic novelist, right? Um, and um, it takes a certain amount of time and investment to plot a novel the size of Anna Karenina. Uh, Nabokov's notion of why it's the, the great novel is that it's so well constructed and um, people invest so much time in, in reading it. Um, and somehow this, this tempor slow temporality in which these novels are um, written and then consumed can't be depicted in the plot of the novel itself, right? So it's kind of present in the structure, but not, uh, not in the events uh, described. Um, so so those, I don't, those are some kind of random thoughts. I also wondered, you, you talked about form more towards the end, and I'm wondering if one can, and this you know, pertains to the Dostoevsky-Tolstoy dichotomy, can one chart dialogue versus narrative um, on an economic grid? Is a capitalist novel more likely to be in Bakhtinian terms monologic or, uh, or, or not? Um, sorry that those, those thoughts were so scattered. Thank you very much for those, Eric. Uh, a number of really, really interesting ideas there. The one, the one that I, I want to respond to first is the slow temporality of reading, of consuming a novel versus the kinds of temporality represented within the novel. Because as you put this, it, it strikes me, and I'm not, I'm not quite sure where to go with this idea, but it strikes me that, again, as, as, as I was uh, writing this book, one, one of the things that was most remarkable to me and this also returns to something that Yanni was talking about uh, in his comments. The way that capitalists, uh, the way that capitalists work as characters in a number of these books. Uh, again, I think Dostoevsky is uh, the one who uh, offers us some of the most perfect examples of this in *The Idiot*. Uh, capitalists in Russian literature. Uh, are often remarkably calm, 
and rational uh, avoid all of the things that we remember from novels, avoid the kinds of behaviors that we sometimes uh, associate with great capitalists in other uh, 19th century European literary uh, traditions. I'm thinking, for example, of some of the capitalists in Zola's novels, I, the kind of daring, speculative, larger than life capitalist uh, is uh, usually the ancestor of the capitalist we read about in 19th century Russian literature. They are not nearly as significant as their uh, regret-filled, anxious uh, descendants. And the kinds of capitalists that are operating within Russian novels uh, kind of in real time, so to speak, do so uh, quietly, consistently, without hurrying very much, without taking big risks. Uh, there's this kind of calm to their activity, which uh, is less like the major characters in these novels with their uh, more perturbed, more kind of intermittent uh, uh, temporality, and perhaps more like that of a reader uh, slowly uh, accumulating the uh, experience of reading this novel over the course of many months. So that's that's interesting to think about. I'm not certain uh, how to continue this line of thinking, but it's very suggestive to me. As far as what a capitalist novel would look like, this is something that I uh, think about repeatedly in the book. Uh, again, insofar as the Russian literary tradition in the 19th century uh, emphasizes a certain kind of literary capitalist, this individual who prefers to be behind the scenes and who avoids events, uh, events in the literary sense as the uh, crossing of some boundary uh, at all costs. And so I think that a capitalist novel in that sense, a novel that would foreground that kind of capitalist is very difficult for me to imagine in 19th century terms. Uh, the closest thing that I can think of uh, are some of the novels of Pyotr Babarikin, which were frequently criticized for not having much of a plot, uh, for having too many descriptive episodes, for being too dependent on this kind of uh, hypertrophy description, sometimes attributed to uh, French naturalism, because perhaps the characters are so attenuated because they uh, sometimes are these sorts of uh, business-minded characters who want to avoid disaster, who want to avoid uh, great expenditure of whatever it is that uh, 19th century literary characters in the Russian tradition frequently expend. And so uh, that's as close to uh, what, what a capitalist novel uh, could be as I can think of right now. Uh, and the consequence of that is this kind of lack of memorability, this uh, diminution of plot uh, in exchange for an intensification of description uh, where less and less happens as uh, capitalists become more and more prominent. I think that to the extent that the major novels of the Russian literary tradition that we uh, continue to read deal with capitalism, they are pretty much always uh, anti-capitalist in the sense at least that they show uh, this range of phenomena that we uh, retrospectively see as capitalism as destructive to the conditions that make these sorts of novels possible, whether those are the social organizations, uh, the, the, whether those be the social forms, whether those be certain kinds of value, whether those be uh, certain kinds of human activity. But in the process, they give a certain kind of form to capitalism, which again, uh, I want to emphasize evolves as a kind of literary tradition, as a tradition of literary representations that continues, I think, uh, throughout the entire realist period. 
so then what uh, a novel that offers a significantly different way of thinking about capitalism would have to be. I think that with that, uh, we would have to venture into something beyond realism, something past realism and into the realm of, uh, into, the, into the period of modernism. All right, and our next question is from uh, Alexei Dovin. Uh, I have a question for Vadim and his brilliant talk. I wonder if, if there were any possible positive representations of factory labor in European realism, i.e. in the British industrial novel in comparison with the Russian case? Or can we assume that factory labor in the 19th century was always negatively represented? Thank you, Alexei, for that question. I'm uh, kind of scanning my memory right now. I cannot think of an example in 19th century literature in which factories are, uh, in which factory labor is represented positively. Uh, if anyone can think of a scene like that, I, I would be very happy to hear, uh, hear your examples. But there are significant differences in the representational techniques employed by European and Russian writers here. Uh, I'm not prepared to make a kind of comprehensive comparative uh, examination of the different European literary traditions and the Russian literary tradition in this respect, but it is very clear uh, to me uh, if we compare, for example, the way that sites of industrial labor in Zola are represented compared to sites of industrial labor in, uh, again, any, any work of Russian literature that I can think of, significant differences emerge. Uh, the, one, the one that I'm thinking of right now that's coming to mind readily is not a factory, but I think it's sufficiently comparable for uh, the purposes of this discussion. It is the mine in uh, Zola's novel Germinal, uh, where uh, there are numerous occasions uh, in which events, narratively meaningful events, take place within the mine, which is already a very significant departure from what we see in Russian literature. But there's also the way in which Etienne, uh, the, the young protagonist, develops an ability to, to make sense, to map the environment that he's in. Uh, as I recall, at the beginning of Germinal, uh, he sees this chaotic mass of machinery all around him performing this inscrutable uh, activity uh, that's very similar to Russian literary representations of the factory. Uh, he can't make any sense of it, but over the course of hundreds of pages, he learns how it works. He gets a sense of what it is like, what, how the mine operates as a giant uh, machine, how uh, workers interact with this technology. Uh, he gains a kind of analytical purchase on it that, again, to my mind, no character in a Russian novel manages to do inside a factory. That's not to say that this is in any sense a positive representation of industrial labor, but it is one in which uh, the subjective experience of someone uh, inside an industrial site uh, is not uh, only this kind of uh, sensory chaos. There is uh, a comprehension uh, that leads at least to the possibility of some kind of agency on the part of a character in an, in an industrial site. And this seems to me a very significant difference. Um, and we have a question from Galina Rokova. Galina, if you want to unmute yourself. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you so much for a delightful and thought provoking talk. Uh, I just have a question and a comment. It is both a question and a comment. I wonder whether you should also consider writing as profession uh, 
particularly in cases like Tolstoy and Chekhov, who was a doctor and a writer and famously described uh, medicine as his uh, lawful uh, wife and writing as his mistress. With Tolstoy, once you mentioned his later comments from the 1900, I started to think that his mowing scene was a little bit self-serving. We know that it was very difficult for Tolstoy to finish uh, Anna Karenina, and uh, he was really trying <laughs> to do everything in his power to withdraw, to stop writing, or to find inspiration in various areas. And you might want to look at his Так что же нам делать? What then we must do from 1886, in which he comes up with a daily routine which leaves him surprisingly little time for writing. I would say that uh, this idea of losing one's, one's consciousness or losing time was extremely appealing to Tolstoy because from his correspondence with Chertkov and Fett, to people to whom he complained about his writer's block, he would say, I would really like to chop wood. I would like to do almost anything but writing. So just to make writing interesting, something that you can forget about while doing it, something less purposeful. I think that it was a, a great problem for Tolstoy, starting with Anna Karenina and uh, I think his work for, um, for Chertkov uh, was a work of love. It was not really something that he was forced to do. This was a digression that he was seeking. So uh, writing as profession, it seems to be an interesting aspect uh, versus capitalism and agricultural job. Uh, where, would it, where would it come? within this uh, uh, dichotomy. It seems that Tolstoy would rather like liked it to be uh, less structured, less with less expectations. Well, I will stop here. Just I would like to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you. I certainly I, I think that it's that's it's important to think about writing as a profession, both in a broader sense, uh, uh, of writing in the context of uh, the Russian print market uh, in the second half of the 19th century, uh, in which some writers were uh, more financially dependent on their ability to sell uh, and publish their works. Uh, Dostoevsky is, of course, the famous example, but there were certainly others. Pyotr Babarikin, again, is another uh, important professional writer from this period. Uh, and in that sense, of course, these works of literature become commodities uh, that need to be uh, sold, uh, that need to be placed, uh, uh, that need to be sold first to, to the editors of journals, and the journals themselves need to sell these copies. And so it, it, it is, of course, very important to think about uh, literature itself within uh, a print marketplace. But likewise, it is, it is important to keep in mind uh, the kind of uh, ideological aims of uh, the various writers that I uh, talk about in the book, and in this case, uh, Tolstoy in particular, in the way that this mowing scene is, as you say, self-serving. I think that it is in multiple ways. Uh, it's self-serving for uh, both the Tolstoy of the Anna Karenina period and for Lyovin himself, because it uh, makes it possible to uh, kind of recuperate these uh, social relations on Leuven's estate that are falling apart everywhere outside of Leuven's estate and even on, on the estate itself outside of the context of the mowing scene. So it is, it is very much self-serving in that sense. It makes it possible to uh, sort of bring back by fiat a kind of uh, way of life that is um, disintegrating everywhere else. But it is, it is certainly also uh, interesting and important to think about this in terms of Tolstoy's own attitude towards uh, a whole range of things from uh, writing literature uh, itself to uh, much of 19th century uh, modern civilization. The Kshturje Nam Dielets is certainly uh, an important uh, example of this kind of Tolstoyan social theory in which much of what 
advocates of 19th century progress regarded as the, the accomplishments of 19th century civilization come to seem completely superfluous to Tolstoy, unnecessary, a uh, 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 waste of resources and the product of the exploitation of uh, laboring peasants. Uh, if I recall correctly, in uh, cities as such become superfluous or come to seem superfluous, just places for uh, the stripping of wealth away from uh, agriculture. And so uh, certainly in these later writings of Tolstoy, these uh, writings in which he uh, condemns much of uh, 19th century civilization with uh, its cities, uh, with its high culture, with its literary culture, uh, in favor of this kind of minimal, simplistic uh, kind of agricultural life in uh, presumably uh, smaller, uh, more organic communities. We can certainly see the mowing scene in Anna Karenina as a kind of fulfillment of this uh, desire, certainly in contrast to other places in which Tolstoy is much more cognizant of the uh, of the great costs uh, for in human well-being of agricultural labor, whether that is compulsory agricultural labor, Tolstoy was certainly uh, well aware of the meaning of serfdom and its legacy in Russian culture and of the kind of general exploitation of peasants uh, throughout, throughout his lifetime. So in certain, in certain ways, it's important to note that the mowing scene is a kind of anomaly uh, again, to return to Rabstu uh, Nashu from 1900, this is a work in which Tolstoy uh, actually also, also does kind of strange work around the issue of serfdom or the legacy of serfdom. Uh, the idea that agricultural labor is free, whereas industrial labor is wage slavery comes up repeatedly in that essay. What's kind of missing in the middle of that is the centuries long legacy of compulsory agricultural labor in the Russian tradition in particular, but certainly well, well beyond that. So that, that's simply to say that Tolstoy's various reflections on agricultural labor from various points in his career, reflections which vary a great deal uh, are always doing various kinds of uh, pretty significant ideological work. Great, so I think yeah, we're running a little low on time, 20 minutes left, and we still have quite a few people who would like to ask questions. So, so I think we can maybe do two or three questions at once and you can respond to sure. them. Does that work on you? Okay, great. Sure. Um, so, um, sorry, Christine Ruan, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, you can go ahead. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, okay, thank you for a very stimulating talk, Vadim. I have a, a quick comment and then a question. So my comment is, and this is as a result of the conversation we've been having, is, is I think that it's important to remember that capitalism is more than just industrial capitalism and that there is someone who's written about sort of what I call commercial capitalism, the, the things that don't happen in, um, in the factories, it would widen out the possibility of, you know, thinking about how these realist writers addressed the issue of capitalism. Um, but my, my question is, one of the things that I was thinking about is, is I don't know how anyone could say that agricultural work is not monotonous, just as industrial work is too. I mean, work is monotonous, right? And so I began to think about that a little bit. And it seems to me that one of the distinctions between agricultural work and industrial work is, well, there are many of them, but one of them is that it, agricultural work connects you with nature and the out of doors and life cycles and all of that sort of thing. And that this is the kind of a loss that happens when you move your work inside and work to the clock and all of that. So I was wondering 
if indeed it is uh, easier to write about nature than it is to write about capitalism or say factory life. And because these uh, writers themselves had no experience and did not like Zola train themselves to understand better what these machines were doing, it made it much harder for them to write about it in a way that was convincing and not boring. So I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much, Christine. Um, then we also had a question from Harsha Ram. Harsha, if you'd like to un unmute yourself. Sure. Um, can I be seen? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you, Vadim, for a very interesting talk. Um, uh, my question is really about teasing out what I think are maybe two potentially um, uh, contradictory narratives, but contradiction maybe in a productive sense, in a kind of Hegelian Marxist sense, in your story, which is about the, the, the relationship between literary history and economic history. And um, on the one hand, I, it seems to me that, that you're suggesting a kind of a a kind of convergence or congruence between literary history and uh, economic history. On the other hand, you're also suggesting a tension or a disjuncture between the two. And I want to invite you to, to comment more on this um, explicitly. Let me explain what I mean. Um, on the one hand, it seems to me that you're suggesting that there's a kind of convergence between the development of Russian literature from say romanticism to realism to modernism that moves in a certain kind of linear trajectory and also the history of modes of production from feudalism to capitalism so that if there is, for example, a relatively um, limited scope for representations of industrial labor in Russian literature, it's because, to use the word that you yourself invoked, it's incipient, right? So there's a kind of a correlation between the incipience of representation and the incipience of the economic phenomenon that is being represented. Uh, and I think that this kind of way of arguing uh, comes from the fact that you're fundamentally focused on the visibility of the labor process as your primary index of the relationship between aesthetic representation and economic reality, right? And one question that would arise is whether that is the only way of approaching this question, right? Uh, but certainly it would appear, at least from the Tolstoyan model that you've given us, that the visibility of agricultural labor allows for a certain kind of equilibrium between representation and description that does not obtain in the case of industrial labor, right? Um, uh, so that industrial labor for some reason cannot be uh, absorbed into the narrative web of plot structure in ways that agricultural labor does. Um, but that points perhaps to another way of thinking about the relationship between literary history and, and economic history, which is not one of convergence or congruence so that literature and economics function more or less in, in tandem and as kind of reciprocal mirrors of each other, but one in which you would have a much more kind of disjunctive, discontinuous relationship between the two. Um, which would come back to the, a, a term that you yourself used at the very beginning of your talk, which is about the epistemic advantages of belatedness, right? Where it's precisely the, the lack of development of industrial capitalism in Russia that allows Russian realism in, an optic onto um, the glo a global process that is, not a, is, not, is no longer available to French or English literature, uh, which is, of course, an argument that has often been made. Um, and in fact, in, you know, the, the classic Russian Marxist analyses of this question, I'm thinking of Razvitya Kapitalism of Russia by Lenin or, or uh, say, Imperialism Kakvushya Stadia Kapitalism. I'm not sure if anybody reads these texts anymore. Um, but Lenin actually talks about, you know, Skachka, Brazne, Razvitya, right? This kind of the sort of the saltatory nature of development. So I'm wondering if a model of uneven development uh, might allow you to also think about the unevenness of narrative form in realism, rather than one in which you would simply have a kind of mimetic relationship between literature and, um, and, and, and society. And that's something that's already, I think, to some extent, uh, visible in Tolstoy's resistances, right, to, to industrialization. But we normally think of those resistances as being nostalgic, right, a kind of a, a desire for the epic uh, 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 nature of agrarian reality, which is which is being eroded, but would that would there be another way of thinking about this that is neither nostalgic nor simply mimetic, uh, 
but which would think about allows to think about unevenness as as a literary as well as a as an economic uh, question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, should I ask? Should I um, have one more person ask their question, or would you like to respond to those two? Just as a reminder, we have about fifteen minutes left, and there are still quite a few people, um, so we might not. All the questions. How about one more question and then I'll try to respond briefly to the three. Okay, great. Um, so we also had a question from Ilya. Ilya, if you want to unmute yourself. Oh. Yes, uh, I'm unmuted. I, I'm afraid I will not be able to, um, to formulate it in a brief enough way. Uh, so maybe, maybe uh, I'll just pass on to, to another question that might um, yeah, because we're running out of time and, and maybe, or Vadim, maybe you can reply. Um, uh, re sure, reply. Can... Sorry. Go ahead. You Tasha, meant, you meant that I might reply to the, 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 the two we've had? Yeah. I would love to hear that, yeah. All right, sure, yeah. I, we, we only have about 12 minutes left, so I, I, I think that makes sense. Uh, so thank thank you both, uh, both Harsha and Christine for your uh, questions. I will uh, kind of begin begin with the second question with with uh, uh, a start of a response to to Harsha's comments, which uh, thank you again. I, they're they're very valuable comments, and I need to think about them more than I'm going to be able to uh, see in a in a couple of minutes but there are a couple of points that i do want to make uh and first of all i i appreciate you bringing out this tension in the account that i gave here between on the one hand the sense in which uh the representational techniques of russian realism are evolving uh in a way that corresponds to uh changes in uh, economic realities. And on the other hand, uh, there is indeed this kind of non-synchronicity between the two. Uh, certainly the, the particular object that I chose to focus on in this talk, and indeed the, the object that I mostly focus on in those first two chapters of my book, that is to say different regimes of labor and uh, uh, industrial labor in particular, uh, encourages uh, uh, that that kind of uh, somewhat uh, perhaps contradictory uh, approach. One one thing that I want to say about Tolstoy in particular, which I emphasize more in the longer written account in the book uh, than I did in the talk, is indeed that Tolstoy's resistance, uh, or maybe resistances indeed, uh, are not just reactive or not. Uh, merely uh, nostalgic, uh, precisely because so much of what he is uh, resisting is uh, yet to come. It is a kind of anticipatory resistance to the uh, transformation of Russia that hasn't yet occurred. Again, uh, that this this is something that gave me pause as I was first thinking about the importance of the agricultural scene in Anna Karenina, that in 1870, what is remarkable about mowing? Uh, clearly, what's remarkable in part is that Leuven is taking part in it, but there is a sense in which it is not, it was not at all obvious to me that uh, peasants mowing a field were threatened, uh, imminently threatened by Russian economic conditions. Uh, and the industrial uh, in the world of industry that threatens to destroy Russia in this novel is very much something yet to come. It appears within the novel in Anna's nightmares in an industrial, uh, in, in a railroad accident that, at the very beginning, but then primarily in glimpses, uh, kind of oniric glimpses uh, from Anna's own point of view. And when Leuven goes to visit industrial sites, he does not tour factories in Russia, he goes abroad. Uh, and I think that's quite significant. So there is very much a sense in which Russia uh, 
being in this uh, belated historical stance uh, is poised in such a way that its writers can formulate responses to things that haven't happened yet. Uh, consider Russia as positioned in such a way that there are multiple paths ahead of it uh, and examine the possibilities uh, of different lines of development. Uh, one of the things that I argue in the book is that the, the famous narrative bifurcation of Anna Karenina between Anna's plot and Leuven's is in one sense an indication of two different ways that Russia could proceed. Uh, even though there's this kind of uh, idyllic anxiety associated with uh, the uh, mowing scene, that it has to be protected from these things that are threatening its possibility, even on Leuven's own estate, there, there still seems to be an attempt uh, on the part of this novel to secure that as a possibility for uh, Russia's future. And there are multiple other scenes, which uh, I would have loved to talk about in more detail now, that point to the possibility of this alliance between a particular kind of agricultural civilization and a, and a certain flourishing of Russian literature that are both linked to the preservation of a way of life that, uh, or the continuation of a way of life that resists industrialization. On the other hand, Anna's whole plot, I think, is uh, connected to this possibility of Russia accelerating out of control in the direction of uh, industrialization, which brings uh, with it the destruction of the noble way of life, the destruction of a kind of traditional Russian civilization, but also innumerable uh, new forms of uh, experience, including new forms of uh, aesthetic experience in the ways that the novel itself, Anna Karenin itself, responds to uh, this industrialization on the horizon, those famous scenes of Anna uh, having her hallucinatory visions that are uh, at least in part motivated by the motion of the train, this kind of remarkable proto-modernist moment in Anna Karinin is an indication, the kind of fruitful potential of the realist novels uh, collision with industrial modernity. And Anna Karinin contains both of these, the, the attempt at a kind of preservation of the agricultural utopia in this idyllic moment with Leuven and the kind of proto-modernist vision of what a human, human sensorium augmented by uh, industry might be. And for Tolstoy, I think that it's quite clear that the former is positively marked and the latter is negatively marked, but the sort of remarkable creative potential unleashed by industrialization is already latent there. Uh, so, that's a start to an answer. Uh, of course, another important uh, direction that I would want to go and that I go uh, in, in the book is the poetics of money and the very different ways in which the Russian novel deals with money. And there Dostoevsky is a particular focus. And there again, uh, an anticipation of potential developments in the future is more important, I think, than uh, a kind of retrospective glance at what is being lost. But uh, in any event, I, I appreciate you bringing this up because these are, these are very important uh, questions that kind of lie at the heart of the book and that I've tried to deal with, but also that, that certainly uh, merit further uh, development and discussion. And then also uh, to return, I'm, I'm just glancing at my notes. Uh, in response to Christine's uh, observations and questions. I, I, first of all, I, I agree. It is remarkable that Tolstoy claims that uh, agricultural labor is not monotonous uh, because sure, it might follow the cycle of the seasons and there might be discrete work tasks, but it's, it's I think, quite hard to think about a lifetime spent uh, performing in, uh, agricultural labor as being uh, exciting and variegated in the way that we uh, kind of uh, are used to thinking about uh, in our uh, kind of 21st century way. Uh, and certainly there are innumerable uh, 19th century accounts about the monotony and the impoverished, the sensory impoverishment of uh, uh, peasant uh, existence. 
So it is, it is quite a remarkable thing for Tolstoy to say, and obviously something said for, uh, for polemical purposes. I think that the different settings of the agricultural labor and the industrial labor are indeed very significant here because nature uh, is, uh, in terms of literary, re literary representation, a set of very well-established uh, norms and conventions that uh, anyone writing about agricultural labor can fall back on, can draw from in a way that the unfamiliar environment of the factory makes it much more difficult to, uh, to, to do. But I'm also reminded here of uh, Elaine Scarry's work on the difficulties of representing labor in general, because it is this strange thing which is neither static no, neither, neither kind of a static scene to be described, nor a narrative with a discernible form, because labor uh, is in principle unceasing. There is never an end to it. And so attempts to give aesthetic form to it are always confronted with this difficulty of figuring out how to give it uh, a sense of its continuing, continuousness, but also to find a way of bringing it to an end. Uh, and this, this, I think, is something that the factory scenes in Russian literature uh, certainly confront. Great. Um, do we want to take last questions or should we wrap up since it's about 2 p.m.? Maybe if someone has a very quick question that I could uh, respond to in a few words. Well, I, I do just, just uh, by way of a follow-up to... Uh, the earlier question and, and Vadim, your response. Namely, would you mind commenting on um, what you think or how you see uh, the, these other kinds of capitalism fitting into your work? In other words, are you uh, focusing uh, exclusively on industrial uh, and, and, and when dealing with agricultural, uh, then uh, sort of bracket out the possibility that agricultural uh, the, the existence of agricultural uh, capitalism as well. In other words, you know, the involvement of money in right this this kind of class struggle that Tolstoy represents occasionally between peasant and he, uh, between Levin and his peasants, mm -hmm. right? Who then organize to, uh, you know, to to uh, uh, to, to to sort of uh, prevent uh, other peasants arriving at the estate and and serve and working for less money. Right, so there's all of this stuff that's that's happening in, in, in ways that uh, that indicate um, you know proto-capitalist um, uh, relationship there as well. Right. Uh, thank you, Ilya. Certainly, uh, there are other other kinds of capitalism that I deal with in the book, and ag agricultural capitalism uh, has a very interesting presence uh, in Anna Karenina, as you say, because it is this danger lurking on the margins of the mowing scene, certainly already well, uh, uh, very much affecting Leuven's interaction with his peasant workers in other, at other moments, but temporarily suspended here. So uh, agricultural uh, capitalism is certainly significant uh, in Anna Karinina, as much as Leuven himself seems determined to kind of expel it uh, when he can. But in the book itself, I, I also deal extensively with uh, financial capitalism, uh, where uh, industry is very marginal and the primary object of representation for a number of writers. And again, Dostoevsky here is uh, my primary focus is money itself, the circulation of money, the different forms that money takes. And there, some of, some of the problems that I, uh, can try to work with are similar, a similar kind of difficulty of giving sensible uh, form to money. Uh, we, we actually talked about this a little bit, uh, you and I, Ilya, in, a, in the discussion of Babarik in, in the uh, other 19V, that in 19th century Russian novels, money is often uh, kind of excessively concrete or excessively abstract, and it's very difficult to find the balance. Either we have the stack of money that's thrown into the fireplace and the idiot and refuses to burn up, or there are these millions that operate somewhere in the background and we don't quite understand what they're doing. Uh, there's no clear sense of how the uh, banking infrastructure works, but there are these extremely powerful individuals who control this money. 
uh, and there, it's it's hard to find a balance between them. But uh, certainly, money introduces a range of different uh, kind of narrative possibilities, uh, and uh, different problems for the novel to confront. Uh, I realize that now we're out of time, so I don't want to try uh, people's patience, but thank you all very much for your questions. Thank you all uh, for staying to the end uh, and for listening to my talk. Thank you, Vadim. That was fantastic. Vadim, thank you so much. Yanni, thank you very much for your comment, and thanks, everybody, for a great discussion. Um, we'll see you all at the next 19B seminar series event.